Hi everyone, Elliot Jacobson here, February 15th, 2022, with a an installment of Disaster Diaries. I have not had an actual installment where I go through some of the disasters that are taking place since, uh, well, really since this channel started. So what I want to do is just sort of go through and give you a little bit of a survey of what is going on around the planet right now. And naturally, I am going to start with my home uh, town right here, which is in Southern California. So let me just take you here. This is, um, this is what's going on right now in California and really the whole West Coast. And, and uh, it's been going on now for about 20 years. I moved to California in 1997, which was a, uh, an El Nino year. And it poured rain and our local reservoir overtopped and all those sorts of things. Um, and pretty much since that time, we have not had a good uh, con several consecutive year period of rain where um, you just felt like everything was okay. And then this study comes out that says, yeah, in fact, this is the worst drought in 1,200 years. This is just an updated study. The previous number they had was about 800 years. So this is not like, oh, out of the blue, it's 1,200. We already knew it was the worst in 800 years. And really, it could be much more than 1,200 years. It's just that's the best they can do in terms of proxies right now with this study. It feels this way. This part of the country feels so dry, and it is so we are so primed for an absolutely devastating wildfire season coming this year. Um, I, where I live personally, I've had to evacuate numerous times since, well, since uh, fires about 20, uh, 2008, 2009 was the first time that fires came very close to our house, about a quarter of a mile away, um, evacuated again in 2017 with the Thomas fire, which once again burned, well, it burned up to the burn scar of the previous fire, so it got about a mile from our house, um, and now all this... Um, bush that's undergrowth has come back again. So a little bit concerned about this year. So yeah, at any rate, that is what's going on locally. Um, now, as far as a little bit of um, global news, this methane growth has been really um, accelerating. And I had a video I put up recently where I talked about my measurement showing that we're currently at 1907 parts per billion and how that is accelerating. Now, all you people out there say, well, it's the Arctic, it's the um, cloth rates, it's the permafrost. That just isn't true. That is not where the methane is coming from. And this is <clears throat> well known just from studying the isotope uh, relative proportions. You can actually sort of do a fingerprint on the methane to figure out its uh, source. And uh, together with some satellite imagery, it's pretty clear that most of this methane is coming from the equatorial latitudes, from India and China, from um, human agricultural and oil and fossil fuel um, so this is not methane that suddenly, we're not in the midst of this sort of expected explosion of methane that will happen sooner or later as the Arctic and Siberia heats up. So rest assured, we're not going to have the so-called 50 gigaton methane bomb happening this year. But this is not good news for those people who say, well, we're going to just get a handle on methane and that's how we're going to stop the, uh, we're going to at least pause global warming while we figure out what to do with CO2 capture. No, as, as long as methane continues to spike up like this, all bets are off the table for the, the, uh, any sort of resolution or interim or delay of the worst impacts of climate change. It is coming really fast. And I have to tell you, last week when it got up to 90 at my house, in February, right, 90 degrees in February here on the coast of California, um, it wasn't the normal kind of 90 where you kind of felt like, well, I could be outside. It was a blistering, scalding, it felt like you were in a microwave oven type of 90 degrees. It was hotter than, than I ever would have thought 90 could be. So, yeah, that has something to do with also just this, the different composition of the atmosphere during these heating periods, the, the relative humidity um, that is in the air or lack thereof. So yeah, and then along comes um, some sort of story, which is uh, typical of um, these things. Um, look, the um, computer models aren't uh, able to keep up with all the various variables that we are 
putting in that sort of thing. And, you know, there's always the case that the story is that um, things are warming faster than previously expected. That's always the news, right? So climate, these models, I just, I just heard that these models don't um, really take into account rising methane. Um, and that may or may not be the case. I don't want to speak for the climate scientists who are building these models. But if the expectation is that methane is going to be um, something that we can manage in order to uh, have one of these 1.5 or 2 C models be the one that, in fact, most closely uh, tracks temperature rise, and we cannot control methane, then all the rest of the models are fairly well nonsense. Um, look, there are glaciers all over the planet that are going, um, going away, and a lot of these are major sources of drinking water. So everywhere you look, you find out that the glaciers are disappearing, they are going away, we are losing water sources, we are losing ice, and um, we're, this, is, this is happening in real time. This is the sort of stuff that you might expect to happen over a period of a thousand years or, or multiple millennia as the climate gradually shifts from an ice age of warm or a cool period to the other. And this is happening in one lifetime, right? All of this stuff is happening in one lifetime. You were born in the year 1980. You will see the worst impacts uh, by 2050 on what is going to happen to global industrial civilization, right, due to climate change and overpopulation and overshoot and all these things. So, yeah, it is happening everywhere. And, um, yeah, one of the things that I just saw recently was this uh, article about the Antarctic sea ice and that this is... Um, well, the ice sheet. So there's different, there's different, uh, there's the sea ice and there's sort of the glacial ice and the uh, ice cap itself that's over land in Antarctica. So this is about the sea ice, that the sea ice is reaching a new a record low. It's already the sixth lowest on record. And there's about a month's worth of melt left in the Antarctic. So it's very likely that we'll see an all-time record low sea ice, as long, well, as far as measurements have taken place. And, well, I mean, one of the interesting things about this is one of the arguments that I, I typically heard from my friends who were sort of um, telling me that global warming isn't happening out there um, was, well, look at the Antarctic. You know, the sea ice extent is at a record high or it's increasing year over year. So this is evidence you can show um, your um, conservative Uncle Fred, when he tries to tell you that global warming isn't happening due to the Antarctic, you can say, ah, but yes, it is. Look, we actually can watch in real time the breakdown of this sea ice, and you've probably all heard about the Thwaites Glacier going on right now, and, um, you know, the fact that the sea ice that is holding back that glacier is sort of expected to collapse in the next two to five years. And after that, it's sort of all hands on deck for how fast sea level is going to rise globally. Again, we're talking about in one lifetime, a person born today, right? A new child born today who lives to the year 2100, if they're lucky, if the planet is still habitable by then, will essentially see the destruction of coastal cities all over the planet. They'll just be gone. So, um, yeah, what do you, I mean, try and picture that, Hong Kong and New York and Florida and, and uh, Amsterdam. And, I mean, just, just the sheer havoc on society that is coming due to what's going on in the Antarctic. So, yeah, I don't want to speak too long about these things. There's some great guys out there who talk about um, all this science -y stuff, but I do want to just mention one thing to you here. The um, Sis and Bro Show, if you haven't seen it, please have a look on this. I have a YouTube channel um, that, well, you can just go to my website, climatedisaster.net, and you will find on that um, website a direct link to the Sis and Bro Show. This is my sister, Hillary. And Hillary is quite a uh, deep thinker about issues. And I mean, one of the interesting things about this um, sister of mine is that we have very different political uh, opinions, and yet we manage to find common ground in talking about many, many things. And we are not 
blocking each other or, uh, you know, this is not one of those things where you have a difference of opinion and then you stick t- and you make that an issue that is going to divide a relationship or a friendship or a family member. So I think it's very interesting to hear um, us talk about where uh, our worldviews are and those areas where we agree and disagree a little bit. And I just want to plug my sister's new book or one of her newest books, uh, A Mother's Garden of Galactagogues. My sister is an expert on herbal remedies for issues with breastfeeding. So if that's your thing, please look for her book. But one last thing, I want to just talk about this other article that I have up here. It's called The Tyranny of We. If you haven't seen this article, please, please have a look at it. Because one of the things that bothers me most personally about social media is how often people use the word we, as in we have to or we must, what we have to do, right? We have to stop fossil fuels. We have to change how society works. We have to do this. We have to do that. And all of this uh, talk using the word we, once you see somebody use the word we, and they are telling you what you have to do because they want you to be part of their we, or what in some sense society has to do that you are part of, you can already um, just just say, well, that's bullshit, right? That, That right there is a nonsense statement and the person who is saying it has just kind of lowered their credibility, unfortunately, um, because that is, uh, it's never going to happen, first of all, these, these fanciful things that people say, what we have to do, right? Even as an aspirational goal, many of them are just wrong. They're just plain wrong. But the main point is that we is used in this divisive fashion to um, sort of separate us from them, right? There's us, there's the we they have in mind, then there's the them who are the obstacle, um, the bad guys, right? So it's us and them. And anytime we have to end fossil fuels, you have, first of all, you have created an enemy, right? You have, you have the them, whether it is the fossil fuel companies or, or, um, you know, people who, who are billionaires or whatever the them is, you've created that. And then you have some sort of uh, cause, right? The cause is environmental uh, justice, social justice, whatever the cause is, right? So if you're not with us, you're against us. And there's the cause, which is, let's just say it's saving the planet. There's us and there's them. There's those evil guys out there. And then there's this, uh, this assumption that if somehow we could do this thing, that the world would be a better place to begin with. Well, it's not going to be better. There is no future in which the planet will be better than it is today. This is a dying planet. We are on a dying planet. We're living here and dying here together. So um, let's not be separating ourselves into tribes and factions with different beliefs. Like, like myself and my sister, right? Those are, we are two people with opposite views on so many different issues. But we're not separating ourselves based on those issues. We are not dividing ourselves. So I just want you to be aware when you are going through your daily life of seeing this use of the word we, we truckers in Ottawa, Canada, right? We anti-vaccine, we pro-vaccine, we anti-Trump, we pro-Trump, we conservatives, we liberals. That's, those are all divisive. And the one thing that we don't need anymore on this planet is division. So look, that's the end of this little rant. I think it's kind of a mini rant. Really, what I wanted to talk about most was that last little thing, the tyranny of we. But um, the, the planet is going downhill really fast. Things are getting bad really fast out there. And it's just hard right now. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for me. And just communicating um, directly with you like this is one of the ways I'm trying to uh, ease my own sort of of grief process that I'm going through. Uh, One of the ways I'm trying to manage my own range of emotions as I try and sort of deal with what's coming and what I see coming every single day. So I have um, this sort of uh, three rules that I go by and I hope that you will find a way to um, let these come into your life to whatever extent you can. Try and find a way to be kind today. 
find someone to be kind to. And, and it, just the smallest act of kindness you can come up with, just that momentary kindness, whether it's um, just helping somebody with a package at a grocery store or waiting for a pedestrian to cross and not being impatient, um, whatever it is, find a way to be kind, uh, find a way to be generous as much as you can. We have different resources in our lives. So if your generosity allows you to give some cash, that's great. But if your generosity is just um, giving a homeless guy an apple, whatever the thing is, you can be generous. Um, find a way to do that, all right, if you can. And finally, find a way to be of service, which means um, some nonprofit, uh, whether it's animal or environmental or, or whatever the nonprofit is that suits your particular um, calling to service, find a way to participate and in a community that has a cause that you believe in. Now, a lot of times political nonprofits, in my opinion, again, are we versus them. So, for example, I volunteer um, with Planned Parenthood at their book sales. Uh, I volunteer for the zoo. I, I used to volunteer with the local police department, right? I volunteered at the local TV, uh, community access TV station. I even helped produce right wing uh, talk radio talk shows, even though I'm completely opposed to that perspective on politics. I support free speech, even if it's speech I disagree with. Um, I volunteer with the opera. I volunteer with the local um, um, movie. Uh, we have a film festival every year, right? So I'm trying to find ways to volunteer all the time. I volunteer with the vaccine clinics helping to give out these vaccines. Um, find a way to volunteer, whatever is meaningful to you. And uh, that's something that is a great service that you can bring to just... Um, help you make it through this process of the um, collapse of global, global industrial civilization and at least keep some sanity during the process of collapse because it is not going to get any easier, right? And so these are just things that we can do that will help us breathe a little bit and help us um, get along a little bit better as we go through this together. All right, everyone, this is Elliot Jacobson. See you later.